morning. Welcome to worship at Milford Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. This past week, we had our Vacation Bible School program. It was different from any other program we've ever done. It was a virtual program. Uh, the kids did their activities at home, guided by videos, some of which were produced by the curriculum, but others produced by our very own folks. And uh, at the end of the day, each day, our kids would get together on a Zoom call with Miss Kelly. I want to show you a video that gives some highlights from the week. big thank you to Kelly Carey for all the work that uh, she put into that program as well as uh, her entourage which got roped in whether they were willing or not I don't know. Big thank you to Jamie Carey for being the guinea pig for the science experiments that took place throughout the week. Uh, thank you to everyone who played a part in making that program possible. I know my kids had a great time and I know the others did as well. Another uh, few announcements. Uh, starting today in fact it is something called Church Week at Rural King. This is a large store uh, on M59 and US 23 in Heartland. And if you shop there for the next two weeks, they will donate 10% of your total purchase to us. All you need to do is go to their website, which is included in the e-news this week, uh, ruralking.com slash churchweek. You can upload your receipts. Again, that's 10% of your purchase will be donated to us. That goes through August 15th, so from now until a week from Saturday. So if you've been waiting on any of those kinds of purchases, this is the time to do that. We are celebrating the Lord's Supper together today, and as we usually do, um, I would invite you to take a picture of your communion table. It might be fancy, or it might be a little haphazard, or there might be messes from the kids in the background. Whatever it may be, it is still the Lord's table because we believe that we are united by the Spirit as we share this meal together. So take a picture of it, put it up on our Facebook page. We have a post with the, the Sanctuary Communion Table. Add your picture in the comments so that we can be connected visually as well as we share that meal together. Take a moment also, if you haven't already, to prepare the elements for that celebration. If you haven't prepared ahead of time, grab what you've got. It doesn't have to be Welch's grape juice. It can be wine, it can be apple juice, it can be Sprite, it can be what you have, and a cracker or bread or something along those lines. Take a moment to prepare those things if you haven't already. Uh, please share any prayer requests that you have by sending an email to prayer at milfordpc.org, and I will share those requests later in our worship. Now, for the next two Sundays, those services have been pre-recorded so that this crew here can have a time of rest, so we will not be able to share those prayer requests live in worship. I would still invite you to send those requests, but to do so by Thursday each week, and 
And we will include your prayer requests in our worship guide, which is sent out on Sunday mornings. So again, for the following two Sundays, send out those prayer requests by Thursday. And now we call ourselves to worship. All who hunger, gather gladly. We come to feast on the life-giving word. Here love abounds and grace overflows. Here blessings multiply as gifts are shared. Come, let us pour ourselves out in prayer and praise and open ourselves to renewal and rest. Great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory Great things he has done. The psalmist prays, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We turn to God to confess our sins so that God might lead us in the way everlasting. Let us pray. God of abundance, in your hands meager offerings become bread to feed a multitude. Your mercy overflows to fill deserted landscapes with hope and grace. In you there is always more than enough, but we see only scarcity. Too few resources to share with our neighbors, too little energy to respond to those in need. We turn from those who suffer rather than offering compassion and care. Transform us, we pray. Open our hands to share freely and generously and stretch our hearts to new expressions of love. Amen. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Amen. 
To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for your goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Let us pray. God, as your ancient word is opened to us, we pray that you would speak to us by the power of your spirit, that we would hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Let us listen together for God's word to us. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we begin a new series today, a series I'm calling Upside Down. And my inspiration for this series is the world, because the world is turned upside down. Everything familiar seems strange all of a sudden. My oldest is a swimmer, and he has been having his swim practices at outdoor pools this summer, and one of them is at a country club. So a couple weeks ago, I was sitting in my car waiting for him to finish up his swim practice. It was about 9 o'clock in the morning. And so people are starting to arrive. It was a beautiful day, arriving to play golf. And I'm just kind of watching people gather as I'm watching for Owen to come out. And I see a, a group of four men coming together. It looks like they hadn't seen each other in quite a while. So there was a lot of warmth and excitement as they greeted each other, but also a lot of awkwardness because they didn't know how to greet each other. And so I'm watching uh, two men in particular as they say hello and they reach out with their hands to to greet one another, but they don't know how, and it turns out they're not really speaking the same language in their greeting. So I watch their hands, and one of them reaches out like this to shake hands, and the other reaches out like this to do a fist bump, and then they realize that they are uh, mismatched, and so they quickly switch, and the other one's uh, fist bump, and then a handshake, and then they switch back, and it's this awkward back and forth until finally they settle on a very clumsy handshake. The things that were normal are not normal anymore. And so this is, I think, a perfect time for us to reflect on the nature of the kingdom of God because, after all, this is what God is trying to do, to turn the world upside down, 
to take the things that are intimately familiar to us and to turn them inside out, upside down, to reorient our lives and our perspective. So each week we'll explore different ways that God is working to turn the world upside down. And we start today with hopes. So James and John go to Jesus and they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now when I say hopes, I mean the things that we're after, the things that we desire, that we really want in life. And Jesus says to them, what is it that you want me to do for you? Jesus knows what's happening here. What's happening in this question that his disciples are asking him is that James and John are revealing their ambitions, their desires, their, their dreams. They are revealing to Jesus their reason for following him. They are revealing to Jesus their deepest hopes. And I think Jesus is curious. He wants to hear the thoughts that are on their heart. He wants to know, where do they think we're going? He wants to know, how do they think this is all going to end? He wants to know what is driving them. So James and John, bless their hearts, they tell Jesus exactly what they want. And they come off sounding just like children who are naive, who have no idea how foolish their question sounds. And of course, in their question to Jesus, they reveal that they want exactly what we all want. They want their efforts, their endeavors to find success. They want all of this hard work in following Jesus, they want it to pay off. They want their sacrifices and their humiliations to be vindicated in the end. They want to make sure they're on the winning team. They want there to be a happy ending. And they wouldn't mind if there's just a little bit of honor and recognition and congratulation for them along the way. Grant us, they say, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Now let's ignore for a moment the fact that they, in asking this question of Jesus, are rather intentionally sidelining the other ten disciples. They'll have their moment for anger just down the road. But this request, even on its face, is an unbelievable request to make of Jesus. And it's very telling, It's very telling of how they think of Jesus and what they imagine this glory, as they call it, to be, what this glory is going to look like. They are operating from the same kind of messianic assumptions that, as best we can tell, just about everybody was in the first century, every Jew anyways. The Messiah, the anointed one of God, was expected to come and sit on the throne of David. That is not a metaphorical throne. That is a literal throne in Jerusalem. The Messiah was expected to rule, to kick out the Romans, to take power, and of course, a ruler sitting on a throne has a right and a left hand, and somebody should be sitting on either side of that throne. And why not us, Jesus? Why not James and John? And Jesus responds to their question with, I can only imagine, pity. He says, you don't know what you're asking of me. What James and John have done, what they have revealed to us, in asking this question, they've done something that's really not that unfamiliar to all of us. They have turned Jesus into a vehicle for their own hopes and dreams. They have taken their ambitions for life and they have mapped them onto the person of Jesus. They have made Him. They've decided that He is the best candidate to help them get what they want out of life. And candidate is actually a very good word here. Just like in our nation's politics, as a, 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 a candidate has the ability to bring others into power with him or her. If you choose the right person, you can ride their coattails all the way to the top. And James and John think they've found the one. The one who can lead them to glory, to greatness, to recognition, and to honor. Now, in Jesus' response to them, notice that he doesn't immediately disabuse them of this idea. 
that Jesus' glory is somehow the kind of glory that will elevate those who are following him. He just expresses a kind of pity for them. And then he plants some seeds. Seeds about what the future is likely to hold for them. They will drink of his cup. They will be baptized with the same baptism. But we don't get the lesson, the moral of the story, until the other disciples find out. The ten discover what James and John have been asking Jesus about, and they're angry as they should be. So Jesus gathers them all together. And he says, listen up, guys. We are not like the Gentiles. You know how the Gentiles operate. They seek glory. They seek power. They seek greatness. And once they achieve it, they lord it over others. But not not with us. Not so with you. He says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Now Jesus shows them what his glory, so called, will look like. He says, for the Son of Man, that's a messianic title, the Son of Man. He's intentionally addressing the expectations that James and John seem to be working from. He says, now, the, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is in effect saying to them, I am not here to seize power, but to show the limits of so-called power. I'm not here to become great, but to become nothing so that the nothings of this world can find life. I'm not here to help you realize your ambitions, but to turn them upside down. I did some reading this week and discovered the swift. It's a bird. The swift is a remarkable bird. I had no idea. It's a relatively common looking bird. Most of them are black, relatively small. They have a long wingspan for their size and a forked tail. But what's especially remarkable about the swift is that it spends almost its entire life in the air. It almost never comes down to the ground. It has tiny little feet because it doesn't need feet. It nests in, uh, on, on cliff faces and under roof overhangs. And perhaps you've heard of the chimney swift, which nests in chimneys. So this bird that spends almost its entire life aloft will come down for maybe a few months at a time to tend eggs. Those hatchlings will stay in the nest for that period of time and take to the air. They can fly at at up to 70 miles an hour. That's not a dive. That's a cruising speed. And they travel incredible distances, as you might imagine, if they're in the air all the time. In one year, they can travel up to 125,000 miles. And in their lifetime, they can travel enough distance to, uh, to travel to the moon five times over, more than 1.2 million miles. But the most remarkable thing, the most unusual thing about the swift is what it does at dusk. At the end of the day, the swifts gather together in the air in a large group, and they're calling and they're chirping. And then All at once, as if they are answering some call that can't be heard, they fall silent and they begin to ascend. And they go up and up until they are completely out of view. And uh, this this behavior has has, has been called the Vesper flight. Vesper is Latin for evening, and you've probably heard the word Vespers as a reference to evening devotional prayers. So every night at dusk, the swifts gather together for their vesper flight as they fly up and out of sight. When all the other birds are settling down at the end of the day in their nests on the ground in the trees, the swifts are going in the opposite direction. And I can't help but feel that this behavior of this notable bird reflects the nature of Christian discipleship. Namely, moving in the wrong direction. 
You're a bird. You're not supposed to be going up at night. You're supposed to be going down. You're a person. You're a normal human being. You're not supposed to try to become a servant. You're supposed to be, try to become great. You're supposed to try to gain recognition and honor and accolades and success. The nature of Christian discipleship is to allow our pursuits, our ambitions, our hopes to be reoriented around Jesus, to be turned upside down. So that as we pursue faithfulness, as we pursue obedience, as we pursue servanthood, the world looks on and thinks we're crazy, thinks we're backwards, thinks we're going up when we should be going down. Scientists who are curious about the SWIFT have used uh, Doppler weather radar to study these Vesper flights, to try to figure out where they're going and what they're doing. And what they have found is that these collections of SWIFTs are going up high enough to cross what's called the connective boundary layer. And that boundary layer is the separation between the part of the atmosphere that is governed by the, the surface of the earth and the unique currents of heat and air that are swirling around that area. And the boundary marks the difference or the, or the transition from that area up to a higher plane that's governed by larger systems of weather and larger streams of wind. And from that height, when these birds are up there, they're able to see weather systems much, far, much farther away. They're able to feel wind currents and actually anticipate the changes in the wind that are coming. They're able to see the patterns of the stars because they're up high above the clouds. They're actually able to follow light polarization patterns. I don't even know what those are, but apparently they're even stronger at twilight when these birds are conducting these Vesper flights. They're able to calibrate their magnetic compasses. At the peak of their Vesper flight, scientists have learned that Swifts have every possible navigational tool at their disposal. They are able to determine exactly where they are and exactly where they need to go. And they don't make this flight alone. They always do this together as a group. Because in order to navigate their way around dangerous weather patterns and so forth, not only do they have to use every navigational tool at their disposal, but they also have to use one another. They have to rely on the community of Swifts in order to figure out the right way to go, in order to know where they are and where they are going. They have to stay close to their community. When everyone around us goes after the normal things, success, honor, recognition, greatness, glory, and we go in the opposite direction, when our hopes are properly oriented, which is to say upside down, when we take Jesus at his word, that whoever wishes to be great must become a servant, then then we rise above all of it and we're able to see with a clarity with which we've never seen before. We have all of the navigational tools of the Spirit at our disposal and we know exactly where we are. We know exactly who we are and we know where we need to go. And we don't make the flight alone. Let us pray. God, we pray that you would turn our hopes upside down. Give us the strength and courage to stop pursuing all of the normal things and instead to do something crazy, to try to become less, to try to become a servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We recently premiered our church's first virtual choir, special music here during one of our services. And we'd like to do it again. 
And I want to invite everyone watching and listening to this service right now to participate in our next virtual choir. So if you're online and able to navigate while you're watching this and send me a message, you can find my email address on our church website, mlapratt at milfordpc.org, and I will send you all the details. We want you to participate. As Pastor Brian just said, you're not alone. Let's all do something crazy together. And this is a way, if you've always wanted to sing in a choir, but you never wanted to be heard by other people, it's the perfect opportunity. So please join us. I won't tell you all the technological ways that I can increase your volume individually or decrease it. Uh, but I just want you to step outside of your comfort zone and consider worshiping God through music in this unique virtual choir opportunity way. This morning, our special music will be our very own Westminster Handbell group. I want to give a special thanks to Marilyn Birkeland for her many years of dedicated service to this group, and also to Dean Birkeland, who together with Marilyn helped to, in a very safe way, bring our handbell ringers together recently into our sanctuary and bring music collectively back into the, this sacred space. And I'm excited that over the next few weeks, we will have an opportunity to share some of the pieces that they were able to record recently in our sanctuary. So thanks, Marilyn, for all you've given to this church through our handbell music, and I hope you enjoy their piece. Let us pray. God of abundant compassion and extravagant love, we join our hearts and voices in prayer to you, trusting your promise to hear and respond, not according to what we deserve, but according to your mercy. When we look within ourselves, we are humbled by the many ways we fall short. We heed the advice of the wicked without even recognizing we are neglecting your commandments. We hurt those closest to us, and we injure those to whom you call us to show compassion. And yet, it is in those dark, lonely places that you appear and bless us, make of us new creations, and reshape us for your divine purposes. We praise you for your unwillingness to let us go, and we cling to you now as we wrestle with the chaos within and around us. We rejoice that you are present with us now. We come to you in need of relief, fearful we do not have enough. 
eager to see Jesus face to face. We gather around his table and we cannot believe that the Savior of the world serves us and refuses to send us away. Having been satisfied with the bread of heaven, we ask to be a part of distributing the mercy, grace, and justice of our Lord. We know we have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. In that recognition, we remember those in our midst who are hungry. As this pandemic continues and many wrestle with unemployment or underemployment or dangerous employment, grant security in all its forms to those most anxious about their well-being and that of those they love. We know that all around us, your beloved children long for healing in body, mind, or spirit. We know you see them with compassion and want for them abundant life. May we be conduits for Christ's power, embodying your love to all. And hear now the prayers of your people as we lift our joys and concerns to you. For my sister coping with leukemia, for courage for her and for wisdom for her doctors, for healing and God's blessings for Jeffrey, who recently con contracted Lyme disease, prayers for healing for Adam and his family, surround him with the loving arms of our Lord, peace and comfort, prayers for Ron and Kathy, Mary Lou, Tom and Marlene, Paul, safe travels for this week. Prayers for two-year-old Olivia fighting stage four cancer. Lord, keep her small body fever free so she can remain at home after this round of chemo. Prayers for Keith, Corey, Tina, and Philip. Thanks be to God that Tina is coming home. Prayers for guidance in new work endeavors and good test results. For Fred and his battle with cancer, for Aunt Judy and Uncle Len going through a very difficult time in their lives. For my brother Paul and family on the death of our beautiful Dee. Wrap your arms around our family to feel your grace and comfort as we have had so much grief and heartache this year. Prayers for my parents, Joe and Penny, for healing. They have COVID and my father is in the hospital. Lord, we offer these prayers to you along with those we haven't spoken, but they are known to you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. You my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. With gratitude for all that God has done for us in Christ, we offer our gifts and our very lives to the service of God's kingdom.
Friends, this is the table of hope. Hope that is found in the body that was broken. Hope found in the blood that was spilled. Hope found in faithful obedience and loving sacrifice. We gather at this table to have our lives turned upside down, to be nourished and strengthened, to bear faithful witness to the kingdom of God, to the world turned upside down. We come to this table to be changed. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust Him to share in this feast which He has prepared. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that by the power of Your Spirit, You would meet us at this table and at all our tables as we celebrate this meal together. Though we are scattered in body, we are united by Your Spirit. Draw us near to You, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he gave it to them saying, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is shed for you. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord God, in deep gratitude for this moment, for this meal, for your people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us. Expect much from us. Enable much by us. Encourage many through us. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.
high hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds all things together in perfect harmony. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and sustain you on this day and until we see the kingdom. Amen.